Let's get started. My technology works when I'm practicing, but it never works when I'm trying. Okay, so good morning, all of you wonderful people. Welcome to the December meeting of the Kansas COVID Vaccine Equity Task Force. It's always so good to see all of you. Uh, I think by now everybody knows who I am, but my name is Jimena Garcia. I'm Governor Kelly's Senior Advisor for COVID Vaccine Equity. And as always, a few housekeeping items to share. COVID operates in compliance with the Kansas Open Meetings Act. The meeting is being recorded and broadcast live for public viewing on Governor Kelly's YouTube channel, which we provided public notice of prior to today's meeting. We ask that you mute yourselves when not speaking to prevent audio interference. And also please state your name and title prior to speaking. I wanted to open the floor for a moment to see if we have any members our new people that joined this month for the first time. Yes, hi everyone. This is Carly Houchin. I am the current chair of the Immunized Kansas Coalition. So I'm joining today for the first time on behalf of Connie Satzler, our, our regular attendee. Welcome, we're so happy that you could be with us. I also wanted to, um, I think I introduced her last time, but uh, just to highlight, we have Courtney Hayden, who works for KDHE as the, uh, let's see, community liaison for vaccine equity. She works really closely with me, and she's taken a really uh, active role as a connector person for paid grant funding, and she um, is available to meet one-on-one -on -one to talk through um, ideas or 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 just more information about PAVE. So I think she'll put her information in the chat or you can reach out to me if you need to reach her. Um, and before we jump in, I wanted to take a moment uh, to acknowledge one of our dear members who's not here today because he's going through some difficulties. That's Broderick Crawford. And I'm getting choked up talking about it. His family has asked for prayers and I'd like to pass the floor if it's okay over to you, Reverend. Carter, uh, to say a few words. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Garcia, for uh, just a moment to lift up my friend and brother. Uh, I don't know, I, I almost feel like Broderick and I, for the last 23 months, have been attached at the hips. We've been working so closely together with so many different projects and different efforts to uh, get in front of this. And so uh, I'm gonna try to get through this without, as a matter of fact, I just, I have an update from his uh, brother, uh, Alvino Crawford, uh, that the family is sharing. Um, and so rather than me give you my spiel, I'm going to just read the words that uh, he asked us to share. There is also a, a group on Facebook, uh, uh, Prayers for Broderick that, uh, you can join as well for any uh, current update. This is the most uh, current one I have uh, from his brother. And it says no measurable changes to report regarding uh, Broderick's status as the medical team maintains vigilant observation while making adjustments that will lead to his expected recovery. We anticipate progress soon and will share updates as appropriate. Uh, They've, they've made some, there's some other information on there, but that's what's relevant. Um, Broderick went in for kind of a routine um, surgery. Surgery went well, but then uh, there came up some complications and he had to go back into surgery and, and uh, has been in, in guarded position since then. So we are praying mightily. Uh, we had one prayer call, and I think there were like 160 people who were on the call, and we've uh, offered prayer for him, his his pastor, uh, and his uh, brothers and sisters were on the call, as well as his mom, and certainly uh, Broderick has uh, two boys as well, so uh, the family is um, maintaining contact with him. Uh, they've got a, a schedule that they're maintaining, and uh, those of us who are close as well has made ourselves available should that become uh, a concern. So just prayers for Broderick. He would want us to continue working and doing all we can. And so we'll do that. But at the same time, our hearts are, are heavy and 
we're waiting for the good news that that things are looking better and better every day. So uh, right now he's we're just hopeful and prayerful. Thank you, uh, Jamina, for uh, the opportunity to say that. Thank you, Reverend Carter. I'm I'm so um, honored that you shared that with us. And we will all continue to send our thoughts and positive energy to Roderick and his family. And thank you for the permission to keep on working. And I do think that's what he would want. Um, and we'll, we'll keep the ball rolling for when he comes back. So having said all that, um, if you could start the slides, Vicki, I will go through our agenda for today. Okay, so I'm gonna start with my usual update. Uh, we're gonna reflect on some of the work the task force has done this year. And our discussion today is going to center on where we'd really like to see this work going in 2022. Uh, we are gonna do things a little bit differently today. and Our breakout groups are going to be facilitated by each of the four executive directors of the commissions, Audrey Negrete of KLAC, Stacey Nell of CAC, Martha Gabehart of the Kansas Disabilities Commission, and Chris Howell is on for the Kansas Native American Commission. Uh, next slide. Great, next slide. Perfect, I'm gonna review the data for vaccination in Kansas and also talk about a new resource for community partners that are hosting vaccine events. Next slide, please. So starting with vaccination, next slide. Here are the most recent numbers that we have. As of yesterday, we have almost 17%. I'm gonna start on the far right with the kids because that's like the newest information. Uh, we have 17% of kids ages five to 11 who have received one dose of COVID vaccine. And this is pretty good. It's a little bit behind the national average, which I think is like, 18 to 19. So we're seeing progress with, with that. In terms of having received two vaccines, almost 56% of the population in Kansas has completed their primary series. 68% of adults in Kansas have received two doses and 46% of kids ages 12 to 17. Uh, in terms of percentage of the population who has received a third dose or a booster, it's it's on the low side, and this is something um, that we really need to be focusing on and, and doing work. So only 20% of adults in Kansas have received a third dose or, or a booster. Next slide, please. Here's another view of vaccination rates over time. So this data shows us the rates. Um, sorry, I'm getting distracted. I forgot to turn off my phone, so hopefully it won't ring. Um, it shows us the rates of vaccination broken down by age group over time since July. So the blue line on the top shows us that people age 65 and up are 88% vaccinated and the broken lines at the bottom are youth numbers. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can see how that's changed over the last few months since July. And the, the one at the bottom is kids ages five to 11. So that's really the one we're seeing ramp up. The others are pretty stagnant, unfortunately, just climbing very slowly. Um, next slide. This is a snapshot I wanted to share of the status of COVID going left to right. The first graph with the black line shows the number of cases per day, and those have been climbing steadily since last month, and they're at about 1,600 cases per day, and it looks like it's plateauing there for now, which is not great. Uh, the blue line on the next graph over represents deaths, which are also starting to increase. Uh, last month, they're up to about 20 per day. Uh, sorry, since last month. Uh, the next graph over uh, with the gold line is testing, uh, which is increasing. And also the final graph to the right is vaccination, which is also increasing. We're at about 14,000 shots per day. Next slide. Here is a, a different view of the youth vaccination by race and ethnicity. Um, and I wanted to, this is not the one by race and ethnicity, sorry. This is just youth vaccination age five to 17. And I like to show this because you can see the difference on the bottom two lines, the yellow and the broken black. And that is Kansas youth um, vaccination. And the broken line is U.S. youth vaccination. So 
you know, we have lagged consistently about seven points behind the national average. And then as the five to 11 shots were introduced, that gap narrowed a little bit down to 3%. It's now at about 4%. So that's just something that I watch and I, I wish that we could at least be uh, in line with the national average. Um, okay, next slide, please. This is the new view. So we've changed the way we're looking at the graph. Uh, and I hope that's okay. I, I think we got used to the one that I used to share, but this is a new view of the youth vaccination by race and ethnicity. Uh, and I think it's easier to look at and you can see uh, really, um, sorry, I'm just looking, um, that we have black youth and Latino youth lagging as well as American Indian uh, and Hawaiian Pacific um, uh, youth. Those are lagging behind the rest of Kansas, which you can see is right here on the right. Next slide. And this is adult vaccination uh, shown in the same form, um, broken down by race and ethnicity. And you can see there's been a lot of good work done. Um, and I am just so happy that now we have the updated American Indian rates. And you can see that the rates are very high, much higher than um, the rest of Kansas, but we still have work to do in our Black community, uh, especially. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to just spend a minute talking about the Omicron variant. So KDHE is closely monitoring the data in Kansas. So far, we have not had any cases of Omicron in Kansas. 100% of the cases are still due to the Delta variant. Having said this, it's it's certainly just a matter of time until it's in Kansas. And we are looking to uh, countries like Denmark, Norway, and South Africa, who have large numbers of, of Omicron infection to try to understand um, more about it before it's here. So, so far the disease has been relatively mild, but we don't know if this will be the case as it spreads more widely. It is very contagious. The infection rate looks like it doubles every two days. So even if it does turn out to be a milder illness, it's possible that it can still overwhelm our medical system if it takes a hold, um, especially layered on top of the Delta variant and flu season and the holidays. And so uh, in terms of vaccine, um, I think it's more important than ever. It looks like a completed primary series. So two vaccines and a booster dose are extremely important for uh, preventing severe infection from Omicron. So we need to be doing all we can to get boosters to everyone over the age of 15 and also getting the primary series uh, for kids ages five to 11. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna shift now and spend a few minutes, my last few minutes, talking about a new resource that KDHG has made available for community organizations doing COVID work. Uh, next slide. What we heard from some community partners who are doing vaccine work is that it's sometimes a struggle to produce communication materials to advertise things that are going on, vaccine events and so forth, and testing opportunities, and that it was really an obstacle to reaching enough people. So. We now have um, an organization called CML Collective, which is a Kansas-based woman and minority-owned business that is uh, contracted with the state to provide free comm support for this work in the community. Uh, they can make physical and digital materials like flyers, posters, social media posts, and they have a set of options that you can choose from that can be adapted so that we can make sure that this can happen in a timely manner. Next slide. This is an overview of the process uh, that you'd follow to request materials, to pr you prepare a request, submit the form, and then the turnaround time is about two weeks for digital and four, three to four weeks for print materials. Next slide. Here's just a little more detail. This is what the form looks like. You'll have to have the exact information in terms of the events, event specifics that you're planning, and then you select the way it that you want it to look. You also can select an option to have it translated into a different language. Next slide. This is the one I love the most. So here um, are some examples of layouts that are available. There are different color schemes, et cetera. Uh, next slide. 
and this is the contact information. We will be sending the slide deck around, so you'll have this available at your fingertips. Um, and that's the end of my update. I'm going to pass the floor to Vicki to walk us through the next part of our agenda. Thank or you. I can stand for questions. <laughs> Thank you, Vicki. <laughs> Dr. Garcia, this is Martha Gabehart. Um, I was wondering about the uh, organization you just talked about and whether or not they advertise that they can produce their materials in accessible formats and that kind of thing. Do we yeah. know? I'm so glad that you're here, Martha, to ask me that. And I don't know the answer, but I'll find out and get back to you. And I hope that, um, that we've already thought that through. But if not, we'll fix it. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, over to Vicki. Thank you, Dr. Garcia, and thank you for that great update. We haven't always had um, a lot of time to uh, sort of build on what Dr. Garcia has presented. Um, so before we do breakout groups, we just wanted to pause and sort of um, work with the whole group, talk as a whole group about any reflections you have or thoughts given sort of where we are at this moment, um, kind of going into a new year shortly. Um, so um, open and welcoming anybody to share any reflections or thoughts you have about where we are currently um, regarding vaccination. Vicki, this is Jennifer Sutherland from Mid-America Regional Council. Um, thank you all for the information. It's I think this is all um, great, especially the resources um, going forward. Um, I think everyone is well aware, but I, I think it should be said that I think vaccination is more important than ever. Um, our hospitals across the state, um, especially in the Kansas City area, are um, in an extremely challenging position. And as Dr. Garcia mentioned, with uh, now flu coming in into the mix and other respiratory illnesses, um, I think it is going to be a long, tough winter. And so I think we really have to push vaccination as much as possible. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for Jennifer for sharing that. Really good point. Dr. Garcia and <clears throat> Vicki, uh, this is Virgil Watson. And uh, we're having the same kind of struggles here in the South Central section of Kansas. And, and I get to visit with my family over the phone and through Zoom about Wyandotte County in Kansas City. And testing is, is a major challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, some individuals, my grandson needed a COVID test and it took all day <laughs> for them to finally find out he couldn't have one uh, until the next day or two days later. And Advent Health uh, is a service that comes out to the home. And so they were able to come and see him at his home and uh, other church members that had been exposed to COVID in the test. And in the South Central Kansas area, you know, it's just a real struggle because people don't work from 10 to 4. Mm -hmm. Testing sites are pretty much saying if you can't be here by 4 or earlier, you know, the appointment they gave one person was 10, 15 in the morning. Well, he, he was supposed to be at work. So he just called work and said, I can't come until I get my COVID test because she said I can't work until I get tested and get some results. And so he was quarantined for quite yeah. some time before all that took place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Mr. Watson. That really speaks to some of the challenging contexts in different communities and I appreciate you sharing that. Thank um, you. This yes, is Reverend sir. Carter. I might mention uh, in conjunction with what Virgil just sh shared about the time, uh, we hosted an event, um, the uh, Health Equity Task Force and many of our partners at the Mount Carmel uh, church parking lot. And it was on Saturday and we had a great turnout. And then 
Mariana um, is on this call as well. And they had a event on Sunday um, and they had, I think, over 270 people who came by to be vaccinated. And by, I think it was like 131 were tested. We had 75 on Saturday and with about 40 tests. So um, we are aware that the times do make a difference. And so uh, mm-hmm. those weekend events and these off time events, uh, matter of fact, I think there's one coming up this Friday will be in the evening from six to eight. So we are making adjustments as we go along and it's, it's making a difference. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that Reverend Carter. Thank you and Mr. Watson are highlighting lessons we've talked about throughout this with vaccines and testing, just that sort of being where the community is and offering different hours and different opportunities is really critical. Thank you both for sharing that. Other thoughts or reflections sort of about where we're at with regard to vaccination? Vicki, one more thing um, that I might share, and I apologize, I, I tend to talk a lot in these meetings, so I'm sorry for everyone that has to hear my voice. Um, <clears throat> I think an important um, um, story or message to share is that the vaccine works. Mm-hmm. Um, anecdotally, I have uh, personally been quarantined with my children for two weeks. They are all three positive. Um, I am fully vaccinated and boosted and I continue to test negative and I have 24 hours a day exposure essentially. So I think those are important messages to share, um, that it works. Um, it is not just the science and the data, but there are real people, um, who are experiencing, um, major exposures and are not getting sick. And I think that is so important um, to share on a personal level. Not everyone is going to um, react uh, to the data. And so maybe it's about the stories. Mm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Jennifer. It's a really, really good reminder, very good reminder that testimony and stories and one-on-one kinds of communication are really critical. Any other thoughts before we move into breakout groups? Okay, well, um, we would like to end um, this year by trying to get my slides to work here, sorry. Um, By really um, reflecting on sort of where we've been um, and occasioning conversations around that, and then also talking about what we hope would be priorities for the next year. Um, I know that this year, I don't know about you all, but I am, shocked on the daily that it's December and that we are within um, sight of a new year. It seems like it has gone quite fast, Um, but really the COVID has done a lot in a short period of time to better understand what's being done in different communities and share lessons learned from the different communities. So on this slide, you see um, several of the, but not quite all of the speakers that we've had over the last year to really learn about Um, what different communities, different partnerships, different relationships are bringing to bear on the work to advance equity in um, vaccination. Um, So uh, we've um, had the opportunity to learn from several of you, um, many of you, about work that's being successful in different Kansas communities. From that, as we've gone along, we have tried to distill lessons learned and sort of takeaway messages. And when we looked back through the notes um, um, and put those notes into a word cloud, um, we there are clear themes that you see sort of in the larger text that sort of that one size doesn't fit all approach is a really critical takeaway from this and that we need to think about diverse strategies and to reach different people and different places and and usually where they're at. Um, So you see going to the people is one of the themes that we've raised up repeatedly as a lesson learned and a takeaway from this this last year of COVID work. Um, And and as um, Dr. Garcia noted in the box, we we have outside normal hours as one of the resonant themes that people have highlighted as working when they've been doing work. Um, But also I think there there are things that we raised as ongoing needs. So establishing more trust, establishing more partnerships and relationships um, to service foundations for this work, I think um, remain as uh, places to improve. 
So with that in mind, we are going to move into breakout groups. Um, there is a breakout group per um, for each of the commissions and um, governor offices, um, and they will be led by our colleagues today. Um, we have assigned many of you to um, groups uh, based on our understanding of your work. However, we understand that that's probably not perfect. So if you get assigned to a particular breakout group and you'd rather be in a different breakout group, um, your um, KU Med Center facilitation team um, will help you out with that. So that's myself, Tatiana Darby, Sarah Landry, and Sarah Obermeyer. We are each assigned to one of the groups and we can help you navigate out to the lobby so that Raina from the governor's office can help us um, move you to a different group. So please feel free to make sure you land in the group um, that you have the most interest in, in connecting about. Within these groups, you'll be working um, to talk about sort of how COVID has worked well um, and what you would like to see for COVID going forward, but also what your um, observations for connecting with specific populations are and what your priorities for working with that population are. Um, Raina will be assigning us to groups here shortly, um, and I will post the discussion questions, um, but uh, facilitators, you might also have to post them as a screen share because I don't think that screen share will carry. Any, any comments or questions before we do a breakout? All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep, we will reconvene with time to report out and um, wrap up for the year. Do we have the ability to share our screen as uh, facilitators? I believe so. Okay. You should, yeah. As when I, um, I'll open the rooms here now and everybody can go in and then you can test that out. And if you don't have a prompt on your screen um, encouraging you to join a breakout room, that means you're here in the lobby. That's breakout room one, uh, Black or African American populations. Thank you, Reina. All right. Thank you, everyone. I must be staying here. Here we are in the lobby. I like. I it. was waiting. I was waiting to be moved. Hello, everyone. My name is Stacey Nell. I'm the executive director of the Kansas African American Affairs Commission. Welcome to group one. Woo woo, group one. <laughs> Sorry, I need to get my professional hat on. Not no, I like it. It's just, <laughs> it real and interesting. Okay, let me share my screen, hopefully, and then we'll be able to get to the questions. Can everyone see my screen? We can see it, but it, there's nothing on it yet. Oh, am I? Okay. How about now? I, fr I froze for a second. Okay. Yes. Okay. We've got some COVID, spe just COVID specific questions and then population specific questions. Before I lose track of a question that I want to ask Reverend Carter, which is how in the world are you advertising to get 200 people to show up to a vaccine event? Because I think we need to, we need to put a pin in that and come back to it later. Um, I don't know. I mean, so you could, I'll give you, I'm going to be quiet for 10 seconds to give you a chance to read the questions that are on the screen. And actually I want to sort of start with an open-ended question. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be quiet, let you read. I know for me, one of the questions that, that is almost most intriguing is if, I, if we envision a world in which the pandemic has ended, how did we get there, right? Like this idea of what do you think we, what's, what's missing? Uh, I agree that I've been in a lot of these meetings where the things keeps, it's being said time and time again, meet people where they are. It's been said time and time again, meet them outside of regular business hours. It's been said time and time again, that it's gonna be communication or excuse me, relationships that, um, sorry, I'm signing with the insider. Relationships are the things that are going to get people to get the vaccination. What are some things we think we still need to do in order to end this pandemic? This is Danielle Norwood from WIVW Radio. Hi. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Hello, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. 
So I think a lot of it is water on a rock. We keep doing what we're doing, but we keep advertising and showing people of color's faces on TV, social media, because, you know, I, I recognize the importance of continual uh, putting things in front of people's faces. It's kind of like throwing noodles at a wall. You're not going to get them the first couple of times. And I really think that the advertising that's going on has been very good. And I think that we continue to do it because there's just, there's a lot of distrust. And there are people that I know in my community who happen to be African-American. Uh, they're like, well, I'm going to wait and see, you know, how it's working. And then we hear the stories about people who have had COVID and had the shot. And they're like, see, see, it's not effective. It's like, well, that doesn't mean it's not effective. It means it's not perfect and nothing is perfect. So I, I just think that we continue doing what we're doing because it's going to take more and more reinforcement of the idea that the shots are working, the shots are available. The problem now seems to be that people don't want to get the booster because now they're afraid uh, that what happened with some of us with the second shot is going to happen with them with the booster shot. So that, that's kind of like my 10 cents of, of what I wanted to share. Water on a rock, just keep going. Keep going. Um, and there was something else you said that I wanted to, oh, it slipped my mind. But yes, anyone else, anyone else want to comment? If we envision a world where the pandemic has ended, how did we get there? Well, I think that uh, touched on the first Carters to uh, avail themselves and make available to us that are out here and trying to get things accomplished events and uh, accounting, but I'm, I'm going to have to and talk to you about what's been effective. I know one size doesn't fit all Uh, hopefully going to keep going in 2022, uh, doing vaccine ideas of how to get in contact with people and advertise. You kind of break up. Is he breaking up for everyone else? Yeah. Okay. You kind of, you kind of came in and out there, but I heard, I heard this idea that one, one, one thing doesn't fit everyone. Like one size doesn't fit all. And then we should continue on moving into 2022, sort of just keeping up the good fight there. People like Reverend Carter. <laughs> yeah, we, okay. we will all do what Reverend Carter says. Um, <laughs> I, I remember the thing I wanted to bring up from um, the, uh, Ms. it's Mills, right, Miss Mills? Oh, it's Danielle Norwood. I'm sorry, Miss Zand is my, is my nickname, I'm sorry. Danielle Norwood, I know because I, I, I watched, I, I have seen all your ads. Um, this idea that it has been a year, right? This idea yeah. that there's a whole line of people who have said, we'll wait and see, we'll wait and see. Well, it's been a year now. So we can see that people are not being tracked by Bill Gates or the virus isn't, uh, I don't know, turning us into zombies. I don't know what people are Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so- Okay, I do want to get to dealing with our, our specific uh, populations that COVID, the second question, COVID has exposed iniquities. So how can we address some of the roots of those iniquities in our work? Stacy, I, I, I want to wrestle with that one, but I really want to, to, to give a, and I hate to put on my theological hat, <laughs> but I really do think that as we envision a world where the pandemic is gone, I think how we get there is things got really, really bad. And I hate to say that in terms of it getting worse than it already is, but things got really, really bad. And then we all forgot about what was different about us. We forgot about our politics. We forgot about everything. And we began working together as one. And when I say we, I'm not just talking about these task forces and 
uh, COVID groups. I'm talking about people in general. And I think if we're ever going to get through this, that's what's going to happen is we're going to forget about all of these other things that are ancillary to getting our community healthy. And as far as the inequities, I think we there's an educational gap. There are people who just don't know. They're, they're making judgments based on, I'm sorry, that's a member of my church who's 103. I'll call her back. Um, <laughs> we're making decisions based on information from somebody who don't have a clue about the realities of health care. And I know that that mistrust is there, um, but I think the way we get through that is by educating. And we have to look for um, uh, a diverse, uh, a whole lot of ways to try to get through this miseducation that's out there, particularly in the African-American community, because that trust related to historical things I mean, at some point in time, you have to move away from that and start to think about the realities that we're faced with now. So we got to keep rolling up our sleeves and keep working uh, to get people educated so that they're making informed decisions. Because right now, I don't think that's happening. I'm what done. do you think is a good way to get that education out there? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Or is I'm it just going, the water on the rock, right? Like, I, like Ms. North? I'm I, right now. I have started. I started last week interviewing, going to various barbershops in the community. You know, Stacy, you and I talked about that months well, ago. I, we I, did I, talk about it. I know. <laughs> I roll up my sleeves and I went to about seven barbershops, and everywhere I went, they were open to having the discussion. And so I'm planning to get together with the barbers in the community, the uh, African American barbers, the Latino barbers. Um, uh, and I'm going to check with Mong Sono to see if there is even some in the immigrant population. I don't know if they how that works, but I'm, I'm going to be working with them. But everywhere I went, they were open to having a discussion because the reality is in the uh, particularly in the African-American barbershops, they're already having the discussions and the decisions, believe it or not, are being made based on sitting in a barbershop on Saturday morning and listening, listening to the people who, who are overly opinionated about what they think and this and that and other, but they don't have any real facts. And I'm proposing having a conversation with barbers and other African-American doctors or uh, 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 doctors of other ethnicities <clears throat> so that they can get the real information from somebody who looks like them. Right. And and I have they've been very receptive. The uh, seven or eight I've been to already. I'm starting again tomorrow. I've got a series of stops that I want to make in the community. But everybody wants to have the conversation and they agree with me that the conversations are already being had and people are making decisions based on what Junebug said or Ray Ray said, as opposed to listening to. Uh, the authorities. Reverend Carter, I have to I have to admit, I heard yesterday that you were doing this type of work and I was like, why didn't he call me? Because we had this conversation back in July. You and I need you and I need to contact because things are things are moving. And so we we need to get together, especially since you if you say you've got seven or eight barbershops that would be willing to work on this thing, we can we've got things in that potentially not, maybe not me, maybe not now, but I there there we can get you connected to some people on this call. <laughs> who, who I've actually had with? a conversation with Courtney already and right. we are actually working on some of that. So yeah, I'm open to continuing the conversation. Okay, okay. I have to keep an eye on my time because I know we have till 1245. It, I need to check, who is taking notes? Okay, hi. And then thank you for taking notes. And then does anyone want to share out when we get back to the larger group? I'm learning my phraseology, share out. Would anyone like to share out when we get back to the larger group? Stacy, you do it. Or Reverend Carter, well, whatever. I don't know why I said that. Anybody, Danielle, whoever. Yeah, yeah that's, that thumb up there, I don't know where that thing comes from. I'm not doing that. It does it <laughs> without my doing. I, I stick my finger up to my mouth and the thumb goes up. So 
ignore <laughs> that <term. laughs> Look for this one. This is the only one that's real. I don't know about that one in the corner. <laughs> so you would like to share out for this group, Reverend Carter? I I will if 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 you guys want me to. I'll be glad to. I'll take some notes and and try to concise it and share. Yes, I'll do that. Okay. And, and when, a I, minute. You know that I need to go to the radio station. I was wondering about. I was kind of wishing that like maybe your spot was switched so you. I mean, I <laughs> you, but I saw you and I was hopeful. So thank you. Okay. In our final couple minutes. Let's see if there's another question I would like to ask. Um, well, I think we sort of talked about this idea because it talks about in the gaps, if there's gaps between how do we reach the population, what, if, what are we learning? What we're learning is that we need to meet people where they are. Um, I do want to bring up, and I know another room, another room is sort of talking about this, but the intersectionality of people who are African-American and if they have disabilities, I don't know if you if you're thinking about that. If people are disabled for what for whatever whatever reason, disability comes in many many you know ways, shapes, or forms. People, I know I was in a, a breakout room earlier. We talked about people who are sick or shut in, or people who have mobility issues. Not I don't have a car to get to the to the to the clinic, but other mobility issues. Is that something that has sort of come across your awareness? I haven't heard about that, but one thing that keeps coming up in my work is pregnant women getting vaccinated. And so I think if we were going to, I think what we're doing now works, so we keep doing that. But I think if we were going to look at what else could work or where we could extend our work, of course, Reverend Carter and Stacy is doing that with the barber shops, bringing in, I would say, bring in the beauty shops and the... Um, but then also we may want to bring in some women, some black pregnant women that have been vaccinated are yeah. black providers. I only have the one in on the Missouri side. Um, but I mean, if you guys are OK with her coming to the meetings, I think she would be a great advisor. Or, of course, Dr. Garcia or Stacy could come to KBN meeting. She's there. Um, but I think it's important because what she tells me is that her patients personally call her to ask her if they can get vaccinated. And so I think what pregnant women are looking for is other pregnant women that have been vaccinated and have no issues because there's these myths about your maternal and neonatal outcomes, but also this myth about fertility. Um, that's going around. And so it's just become major concerns, not just for, you know, black women, but also for black men too. So maybe thinking about that because that fertility myth has also been mentioned in amongst black men. Yes. We know about Nicki Minaj's cousin's yeah. neighbor. And, and Stacy, we hosted a big event one Saturday in Wyandotte County and we only vaccinated three women. And so again, I think Charlotte is right. That's a gap that we are missing and, and we've got to educate them. And I, I love the idea of having pregnant women, people who look like us, again, even in that fashion. And I, well, that's another story. I'm, I'm gonna get into that. But, but I think that's a great idea to have pregnant women who've been vaccinated to tell them it's okay. You know, particularly, you know, can you imagine a lady having had her baby and they laying there and I got my shot, uh, you know, while I was four months pregnant and now here's the baby and I'm okay. And I mean, that's, I think a great tool. That yeah. could be a great tool. Now in our, in our two minutes that are left, I do want to ask you, Reverend Carter, how are you advertising to get still this late in the game, this late in the, in the, in the push to have events at your churches? Yes. Saturdays and Sundays, yes, off off work hours type situation. What are you doing to turn out 200 people at this stage? Well, again, I, I, I don't want to take credit for that because uh, all we do is advertise it and we send out flyers through the Health Equity Task Force and we have certain places where we take them. Uh, I took uh, flyers to the barbershops while I was doing this because we did it on a Wednesday. The uh, event was on Saturday. So I took flyers to the barbershop we have it in English on one side, Spanish on the other side. So it doesn't matter where we go. 
uh, is generally a, a language that they can can hear. Uh, and the, the same thing with the event on Saturday that uh, Mariana uh, Rivera was did a wonderful job uh, of advertising, and the community was those the the Latinos and most of the people at Sacred Hearts were Catholic and Latinos, but they were primed, and when it came to where they were, it made that much difference. And I think it's just we use flyers. We use Facebook. We use all of the mediums that are available to us and word of mouth. And I think uh, that's made. We had Telemundo came and did some uh, pictures of the event on Saturday that they shared that also helped, I think, to some degree, uh, prime what happened on Sunday as well. So it was just a convenient time. And there were a couple of people who had had outbreaks at their, not necessarily outbreaks at the job, but they had four or five people at their job and they worked in close proximity to them. And so they were out to be tested for that. We had a lot more tests than we had anticipated. And so we had to make some rearrangements of what we were doing, but it's just word of mouth, flyers, uh, social media and so forth. So testing is still a very much an issue. Like testing is, is something that we still need to push. We won't know where the virus is if we don't test. I, say I have to ask, pulpit, is testing, is if, if, if I were to tell you, hey, listen, you can go to Walmart or Walgreens and buy yourself a bag of tests. Is that helpful to our community or? I, I don't know if people have gotten test. to the place where they'll buy them yet. Go ahead, Virgil. I'm sorry. I, I think I lost my, my internet for a minute, but testing the home kits are a little complicated to get. So if there's some difficulty actually being able to perform the test. Yeah, I will take that information to my next meeting after this. Right. <laughs> that's something that's strongly crossing my mind. Okay. One last thing, Gar Dr. Garcia. Yes. Uh, uh, Courtney and I have been working on the paved. And in the section where it tells you how you're going to perform equity, it won't let us wrap into the, our text into that format that's been given to us on the application form. Okay, I can, I will uh, get with Courtney and figure out how we can fix that. Thank you. See if it works or whether it does or not, but it is a problem. Okay, thank you. All right, I think that we are all back in the meeting room. Um, so our next few minutes, um, we'll just do a brief report out from each group uh, to describe sort of what was discussed at a really high level. Um, hopefully everybody had a good chance to have a good, nice discussion. Um, so I might start out with breakout group number one, which was focused on black or African-American populations. Stacy or someone else from the groups, would you mind reporting out for just two minutes. I believe Reverend Carter is going to share out for us. Go. <laughs> Preacher, two minutes. No way. <laughs> uh, I do want to share that we talked about uh, uh, filling the gaps uh, that lead to the inequities in the African-American community. Uh, and as Virgil had mentioned earlier, meeting people where they are, and that could concern what times you do it, uh, and where you do it. You want to go to where the people are. And so those are the th kinds of things that are emphasized. We talked about some of the educational gaps that often uh, in the African-American community, people are making decisions with wrong information, with misinformation, information that they got, for instance, at the barbershop, and they were listening to Junebug and Ray Ray and Pookie Nim talk about why they're not getting vaccinated and uh, we're working on one of the things we're trying to do is to gather those barbers and have a conversation with uh, African-American doctors and epidemiologists and trying to get the right information to those people. And some of them invited us to come on Saturdays where they're the busiest and where those conversations are happening. And so that's one way of trying to uh, fill that educational gap that's there. Uh, we talked about whether or not there are uh, people who have disabilities that are impacted by what's going on. Uh, we also talked about pregnant uh, women uh, getting vaccinated and uh, uh, 
uh, uh, Charlotte shared that uh, one of the successes might be to have pregnant mothers who have been vaccinated to talk to the women who have not been vaccinated as a means of filling that educational gap. And she said many of the people who have been vaccinated responded because they made a personal call uh, to their doctors and got their opinions about whether or not they should be uh, vaccinated. And then we talked about how important it is for us to continue to push testing because testing is the only way for us to uh, know where the virus is and to know whether there's an uptick or what's going on. And so emphasizing testing is important and how you communicate that is important. And we have to use all of the mediums we have available to us, flyers, social media, Facebook, and so on and so forth uh, to try to get that word out. Two minutes. Well done, sir. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Reverend Carter, for that update for the group. Um, our second group was a breakout that was focused on Latino or Hispanic populations. Aude, will you report out for the group or? Um, uh, yeah, I can. Would anyone else like to report? Okay, I, I can do it. We had a really good discussion about the barriers and opportunities with the barriers, um, about uh, things like fatigue, and COVID fatigue, and how people think we're over it, but we need to continue pushing the information. Mariana went through all the issues that the community is encountering uh, when, uh, when they're hesitant about the vaccine, like fear, not getting information in a way that's uh, digestible, like many technical terms or poorly translated material. Uh, so those are all opportunities to do better. Um, and um, one of the things, and, and, and when we got disconnected, we were starting to talk a little bit about, now that we know all those uh, barriers, uh, what are the opportunities to create change for, through COVID? And one really good idea was to, um, so for the people who are not able to take time off work or are afraid to take the vaccine because they, are, uh, they might not have sick time, could we connect them with local resources that, uh, that can give them help like delivering groceries, uh, food, uh, so there are uh, a lot of resources that we might not think about as directly impacting the COVID vaccine, like deliveries, <laughs> free deliveries. But when we go back to the source of the issues and we listen to uh, why the community is not getting the vaccine, they're 100% related. It's the cycle. Um, uh, so uh, I, uh, I, I think one of, as I said, one of the big things that came out is how do we advocate for maybe employers to be more considerate about giving people time off if they get vaccinated? Uh, or how do we advocate to connect people to those local resources that will allow them to get vaccinated? Great, thank you for that update and report out, Aude. Much appreciated. Um, the third breakout group uh, was focused on um, American Indian or indigenous populations. And um, we, uh, Chris facilitated, um, I, I, I asked, I think I'm to report out, but Chris, I saw you turn off your mute. So did you want to say anything? No, I was just gonna say, take it away, Vicki. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, well, I feel really fortunate because we have a small group and so it ended up being much more of a conversation. Um, and um, that I honestly really um, am grateful and appreciated the opportunity to hear from um, Chris and a new COVET person joining us today, um, Tom Anderson from the Association of American Indian Physicians. I hopefully got that acronym close to right. Um, we had a great conversation. Um, it began by just acknowledging um, that nationally there were a number of tribes that endured uh, many months of limited access to vaccination and efforts and that 
that some nationally tribes were hit very hard, particularly Navajo populations. Um, and uh, the the um, Chris and Tom connected that very much to recent issues with influenza vaccination and just the ongoing need to connect that to broader conversations about vaccination. It was also noted that myths and misinformation is very pervasive, things like microchips, impact on pregnancy and fertility, and that healthcare workers are among the hesitant um, and that this has had an impact on uptake. Um, I, one of the points that was made was that um, we should focus on this being a public health issue, not an individual health issue, and that this is consistent with the values of, of tribal communities because we, not me, is a, a commonly held shared value, and that framing messages as um, thinking about the future and protecting culture and protecting community could be effective. Um, it also was noted that tribal uh, vaccination rates were quite high and that in Kansas in particular, once um, tribal communities had sort of vaccinated as well as they could, um, they, they opened up to external communities and generously shared and opened their doors to, to bring other communities in. And then we closed by talking about communications and that there were some initially effective communications that were focused on provide, provide uh, protecting elders, connecting to the history of loss of culture and population from previous infectious diseases. And we centered on sort of talking about loss of language and culture as an important concern um, um, that can be spoken to possibly to encourage vaccination as we go forward and ended by sort of reflecting that personal stories are really critical and can be intertwined to convey the importance of vaccination. So hopefully I captured that conversation well. Chris, anything to add? No, you captured everything very, very well. I can't think of anything that was missed. I appreciate it. All right, thank you. And we'll end our report out with breakout group number four, um, which was the breakout focused on populations with disabilities. Martha, will you be reporting out for briefly? I can, I can do some and then Sarah, if I miss things, if you could just um, go ahead and interject those, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Uh, we talked about what it would look like uh, afterwards, after the pandemic is over and what it, it took to get there. There was talk about um, education about the boosters and how important they are and that there would be um, marketing that's appropriate to the different groups that are being targeted. Um, talked about the uh, difficulty reaching some folks like those folks who are homebound and how can we communicate with them in order to make them aware of how to um, get those vaccines in their own homes. Um, also, uh, it was mentioned that it would be nice that a, the, a person's physician, personal physician, would be uh, able to give the vaccinations like giving flu shots and those kinds of things. So if you could get your phys physician to get, be able to give you the vaccination, it would help a lot of people who maybe couldn't get out otherwise. Um, let's see. Um, I remember we talked also about um, the lack of availability uh, and testing earlier and that maybe we'd almost need to make it universal. 24 seven or something so that people don't have to worry about not going to work or missing work or something like that. Sarah, did I miss anything? No, I think you got, you captured it well. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Martha. And thank you to everybody for participating in what it sounds like we're break, great breakout group um, discussions. We're really grateful. Um, and we will report back. These notes will be stored in the notes that are distributed about the overall meeting. With that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Garcia to close us out. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before we close for today, I want to remind everybody that we are taking a pause in January. We're in the process of thinking through how this task force can continue to be effective, but maybe be even more effective going forward. Thank you again to all of you for spending this hour with us. Thank you, Aude, Stacy, Martha, and Chris for facilitating. Uh, we, like Vicki just said, we're gonna send out the notes and uh, the slide deck, and we will all keep Broderick's, Broderick in our hearts and keep working until he's back. So thank you everybody and uh, happy holidays. Happy holidays.